Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to my PhD dissertation defense titled Design of Cellulose-Based Materials via Sustainable and Scalable Processes. So since their popular introduction in the beginning of 1950s, uh, fossil-based plastics have entered almost every aspect of our lives. And this is not surprising uh, when, we, when we consider the highly desirable properties of, of plastics, especially from a material science perspective. They're, uh, they're easy to process, they can be made into high-performance materials, and they're chemically resistant to almost anything. However, we can't really say the same from, from an environmental perspective, and this is because uh, easy to process essentially means these plastics are produced in high volumes, and uh, their, their uh, um, resistance as well as high performance essentially renders them non-biodegradable and environmentally persistent. The combination of these features uh, leads to their bioaccumulation in, in, our, in our ecosystem. As a result, uh, fossil-based plastics and the pollution they create is uh, one of the most pressing environmental issues today and must be addressed immediately. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, with its 17 Sustainable Development Goals, aims to uh, tackle this problem at its core by calling for an urgent global partnership to, uh, to establish uh, circular material solutions. And uh, among these, the development goal number 12, which demands responsible consumption and production patterns, actually attempts to reduce the, this, this persistent plastic waste by encouraging sound alternatives to oil-based plastics. And when I say sound, this essentially means uh, these materials must have similar performance as well as uh, similar processing rates to the plastics that they're basically trying to replace. Cellulose is a highly viable candidate uh, to perform this transition uh, as, a, as a sound alternative to uh, fossil-based plastics. And this is because, one, cellulose is biodegradable, and uh, also it is obtained from renewable sources. Uh, furthermore, it, is, it has excellent mechanical properties, but most importantly, it is supported by an established pulp and paper industry, which can help facilitate this uh, transition going from fossil-based to renewable within a realistic timeline. So wood uh, is one of the major sources of, uh, of cellulose, as uh, Professor Saito pointed out. And uh, wood is basically organized in a hierarchical structure where uh, cellulose fibers are aligned cellulose fibers basically make up the wood tissue. Uh, the, the fiber wall in these, uh, in these cellulose fibers is essentially a layered structure where cellulose nanofibrils or CNFs are embedded uh, within uh, a matrix of hemicellulose and lignin. And uh, then these CNFs are in turn made up of uh, linear chain cellulose polymers. So cellulose fibers have been used for, for years to prepare uh, materials like papers or board products, uh, and, and these are great. However, if we really want to uh, extend the applications of cellulose and cellulose fibers and improve these materials further, we basically need to unlock, uh, to unlock their full potential, we need to um, go in and access their nanoscale building blocks, which are CNFs. CNFs have, have uh, highly interesting properties. Uh, they have high specific surface area, they're very strong, they're hydrophilic, and uh, they can be used to prepare a variety of materials, like uh, foams uh, that can be uh, used as cushioning material, or uh, transparent and gas barrier nanopapers uh, that can be used in packaging applications. They can be combined with uh, polymers to prepare uh, polymer composites, uh, for, for structural applications, or they can be combined with other materials to prepare hybrids uh, for certain functional applications. So then one might ask, uh, what are we waiting for? Why are we not replacing plastics already? Well, this is a multifaceted question, and the answer has several layers. From a processing perspective, it's basically because we haven't found an efficient way to uh, liberate to ac access these uh, CNFs and then uh, process them efficiently yet. Uh, and for that, let's take, let's take nanopapers, for example. So nanopaper is uh, much like a paper, but instead of uh, using cellulose fibers, it's, it's made of CNFs. It's transparent, it has uh, really good barrier properties, and it's very strong, so it, is, uh, highly, uh, it has high potential to replace fossil-based plastics in applications such as packaging. But how do we make it? So uh, the conventional way of uh, obtaining nanopapers is uh, first take the pulp fibers and then we send them through a high energy intensive uh, process called uh, homogenization in order to uh, access these CNFs. Once we have the CNFs, then we need to dewater them or we need to process them, which is basically dewatering and drying, mostly just getting rid of the water. 
And this takes a long time. So here we have uh, high energy demanding uh, homogenization as well as uh, um, long time uh, dewatering that requires long time. And the reason this actually takes a long time is uh, one, uh, CNFs have high specific surface area and uh, they're also very small, so uh, a, lot of, a lot of surfaces. And also they're hydrophilic. Now, uh, cellulose being hydrophilic, like most other biopolymers, is actually not that bad at all, uh, especially when we look at it from a processing perspective. Uh, we, can, we can process these materials using water-based technologies, even though they take long but at least we can use water-based technologies. And also, after, they're, uh, after we're done using them, it, uh, their interactions with water essentially means that we can, uh, they're, they're susceptible to, uh, to biodegradation uh, more uh, compared to you know, oil-based plastics. But this can create a problem, uh, especially when we're using this material. And this is because cellulose swells in the presence of water, which we have around us all the time. And when this happens, it starts losing its properties. It becomes weaker, and it also uh, starts losing its barrier properties, and et cetera. There are certain things that we can do to uh, improve these, address these uh, issues or shortcomings of, of cellulose. One of them is performing chemical modifications. But then, of course, the question becomes, how much modification is required? How much is too much? After all, we can't completely modify this material until it becomes something else. So we need to uh, keep that in mind. We need to uh, focus more on the interactions rather than the, the material itself. So in short, what do we need today? We basically need uh, high performance materials, high performance cellulose based materials. And when we prepare them, we need them to stay that way. So for that, we need to address certain shortcomings of, of cellulose. And when we're doing this, we need to keep the modifications to a minimum in order to not change the, the overall structure of cellulose to an extent that it becomes something else. Because if we do that, we're basically back where we, uh, where we start with, with plastics. But most importantly, while we're doing all of this, we need to do this fast to keep up with uh, industrial processing rates. So in order to uh, address these, uh, these challenges and the problem, uh, we in this, in this thesis, we describe um, a, a material, a, a cellulosic material that's basically modified cellulose fibers, and it's called self-fibrillating fibers. And within, uh, around this material, we outline three uh, different research, uh, research objectives. And these are uh, selecting aqueous modification methods uh, for, the, for the controllable swelling of the fiber wall, and uh, then uh, basically look into the forces that are acting on it. And then using what we have learned, uh, the second objective is to develop uh, in situ nanofibrillation of, of fibers for uh, rapidly converting papers into nanopapers, thereby speeding up the nanopaper pro uh, preparation process. And then finally, uh, using uh, this material and a uh, new uh, processing platform, we uh, are uh, describing a new, uh, a new preparation method for functional hybrids as well as cellulose nanopapers. Around these uh, objectives, or based on these objectives, the results of this thesis can be divided into three parts. Uh, part one will be about preparation and characterization of self fibrillating fibers. And part two, I'm going to talk about the in situ nanofibrillation of, of papers into uh, nanopapers to speed up the process. And then in part three, uh, I'm going to extend uh, the applications of these materials uh, by um, showing the preparation of functional nanocomposites and CNF nanopapers. And then I'm going to move on to show you three different applications of, of, these, uh, of these materials where, where they can be used. Okay, so uh, moving on to part one, the preparation and characterization of SFFs. So what, what are SFFs? Uh, SFFs are basically uh, chemically modified fibers, cellulose fibers, that uh, behave like ordinary fibers. They can be processed and uh, using ordinary paper making equipment uh, at low pH using, uh, using, these, uh, using these SFFs. But one interesting thing about them is that we can, uh, in situ we can nanofibrillate them uh, on demand with external stimuli. And uh, how are SFFs obtained? So it is basically a two-step uh, chemical oxidation process. And uh, in the first step, we perform tempo, tempo oxidation. And the goal here is to introduce carboxyl groups in the C6 position that would uh, facilitate uh, swelling. And then in the second part, we perform pariodate oxidation in order to uh, alter the supramolecular order of the fiber wall 
And we do this by introducing um, aldehyde groups in the C2 and C3 position that are also capable of uh, forming hemiacetals at, at low pH values. So as I said, one of the important things about these modifications is that they need to, uh, they need to be not too harsh. They need to be focused more or less on the surface rather than changing the internal structure of the material. And the SCM uh, images essentially indicate that we mostly retain the fiber morphology. SFFs look rather like they, they have a distinct fiber morphology. They look like collapsed uh, fibers. But even though these fibers, uh, they, they look like fibers from outside ordinary fibers, they're actually far from it when we, uh, when we take a closer look. So the chemical analysis here shows the introduction of uh, carboxyl and aldehyde groups following the two-step oxidation process. An interesting thing to note here is the decrease in charge as we perform pyridate oxidation. Uh, this can be attributed to the peeling and dissolution of highly modified surfaces. And we can also see that in the uh, lowering of the carboxyl peak when we look at the FDIR following the pyridate oxidation. Similar observations can also be made by looking at the solid state NMR measurements, uh, which we perform to uh, look at the, um, the supramolecular order of, of the material. So the first thing we notice is uh, around 172 ppm, where we see a slight, a slight suppression of the carboxyl peak, which is in line with the charge measurements as well as uh, FDIR. The other thing is that when we look at uh, around 63 ppm, where the C6 uh, hydroxyls are, when uh, we look at the native, uh, P, the native uh, data set for the native fibers, we see that uh, there, is this, uh, there is this peak that basically represents the surface hydroxyl groups. Following tempo oxidation, this, uh, this peak is rather suppressed. That's because the, uh, these C6 hydroxyl groups are modified. And then the interesting thing is when we perform pyridate oxidation, we see the reappearance of, of these uh, fresh new surfaces, which basically indicates what was modified and what was on top is gone. And uh, we have uh, fresh surfaces coming up, which is also an indication of uh, peeling and, and dissolution of highly uh, modified surfaces. So uh, moving on to uh, how this material is actually the, the modifications we perform are mild and how uh, we don't really uh, go too much into the structure of the material, uh, the crystallinity pretty much remains the same following, uh, following both oxidations. And uh, we can also see the same thing by uh, lateral fibril dimensions, which, which do not change. And all of these indicate that this material rather has a core shell structure where uh, we have an amorphous modified uh, shell followed by uh, or, or which uh, envelopes uh, a crystalline core. And this, this is important because this pretty much decides or uh, determines how this material behaves, how it swells, and how it nanofibrillates eventually. So uh, speaking of swelling, swelling of uh, fiber wall can basically be described in uh, gel swelling terms. And uh, in short, what happens is th there are three forces that are in, in balance. And what will happen to the fiber wall is decided by their net equilibrium. So these forces are the, the ionic contribution, which is pi ion, and it represents the, the osmotic pressure buildup. The, the pi mix, which is the mixing contribution, and it is uh, cellulose interactions with water. And then pi def, which is the network contribution. And this represents the restraining forces within the fiber wall that, uh, that oppose the, the swelling. It's, it's the integrity of the fiber wall. So uh, these forces are in a constant tug of war, so to speak. So everything, every, you know, one is pulling in one direction. And if the net uh, force is zero, nothing happens. The fiber, basically, uh, fiber wall retains its status quo. But when the equilibrium shifts for one reason or another, um, then the fiber wall will, will, will swell or vice versa. In SFFs, we actually... Uh, use these modification protocols in order to shift this equilibrium uh, in a certain direction on purpose. And the idea here, how we do this, is basically uh, we perform tempo-mediated oxidation that uh, introduces carboxyl groups, which in turn uh, increases the pi ion. And then in the second part, we perform pyridate oxidation, which alters the, the ordered structure within the fiber wall, essentially making the fiber wall weaker. So 
we have a combination of uh, increasing swelling and uh, weakening the fiber wall, which results in the extensive swelling of, of, these, uh, of these fibers. And we can see that by looking at the fiber saturation point measurements. So uh, swelling of the fiber wall is usually accompanied by a change in dimensions, uh, an increase in dimensions, as well as a decrease in cohesion or softening. And we can follow this by uh, doing performing AFM indentation on these fibers. And uh, how we do this is we basically have these fibers in a liquid cell, and as we change the pH, we literally poke these fibers uh, in order to uh, measure its, its stiffness. And uh, normally, as I said, when the, when the pH increases and the fibers swell, we expect these, the fiber wall to become softer. But then a, a rather peculiar thing happens for SFFs when we uh, see in blue, going from pH 2 to 5, the fiber wall actually becomes stiffer rather than becoming, um, becoming softer. Even though this is peculiar, there is actually an explanation for this. And uh, what, what, what happens is, if we move on the right to the schematic, so at pH 2, uh, the carboxyl groups are protonated and the, the hemiacetals are intact, so the fiber wall doesn't have any incentive to swell. It stays as it is. When we go from pH 2 to pH 5, what basically happens is the carboxyl groups are deprotonated, so there is an incentive to swell. However, we still have the hemiacetals intact, which means um, the, it's, and we see this by uh, the arrows, can, can, can also represent this in, in black. We want the, the, the fiber wall wants to swell, and whereas in, in red, it is uh, counteracted. So this creates a tension on the surface. And it is, if we want to use an analogy for this, it is much like um, if you have a spring that's in tension or um, trying to blow up a balloon that uh, you're holding tightly in your hand. It will, of course, become uh, tighter on the tensor on the surface. To, uh, to test this idea, we have performed the, uh, the same experiment uh, in high salt content. And what we saw was, uh, and the idea behind doing this is to screen the charges, thereby hindering the effects of these black arrows to, to uh, lower um, the effects. And what we saw was, uh, as expected, the, the fiber wall going from 2 to 5, it, uh, it doesn't show that tensing, it softens. And then when we go to pH 8, essentially the hemiacetals fully break and the fiber wall swells and becomes even softer than where it started. And this essentially indicates the cooperative effects of, the, of these swelling forces in the extensive swelling of these materials. So even though uh, you know, these uh, equations and plots are pretty cool, nothing really beats seeing how these fibers swell uh, with your own eyes. Uh, we basically perform the same thing uh, in a liquid cell, increasing the pH going from 2 to above 10. And uh, we follow this with the polarized optical microscope. And if we look at the video, uh, we basically see the extensive swelling and changing of dimensions of these fibers, uh, quite apparent, as opposed to the unmodified fibers where nothing really happens. After seeing uh, how these fibers swell, we decided to uh, find a way. How, how can we uh, apply this in a way that uh, we, uh, we can utilize this in an application? And uh, the idea here is that since they, they change their dimensions to, uh, to a great extent, we could maybe use these materials as, uh, as pH responsive filters, where at low pH, these materials, uh, as a filter, the fibers are deswollen and the, the pores are, are big, so the flow is uh, quite high. And as the pH increases, we basically uh, have the pores closing because of the swelling and increasing of the dimensions of these fibers, and uh, we can basically regulate flow this way. And we see, uh, going from pH 2 to 12, uh, the the flow drastically decreases. And this can be used in uh, pH responsive applications uh, or pH sensitive applications where, um, for example, if you have, uh, if you have a, a, a process where you do not want the pH to go too high, you can have these filters as a built-in fuse, so to speak, that if the pH starts increasing in the, in the process, the, uh, the flow will be uh, stopped by these, uh, by these filters. Similarly, we can do the same thing, apply the same uh, concept to nanoparticle filtration. And uh, it's, it's the same thing. We prepare the filters the same way, just depositing uh, these uh, fibers on a regular filter paper. Then we can increase the particle retention about a factor of 15 by going from pH 2 to pH 12. And we can see the surface of these filters uh, by EDS, uh, the difference, basically, the 
at, at pH 12, it's lit up like a Christmas tree, whereas at, at pH 2, there's, there's nothing because everything has uh, more or less gone through. So to summarize part one, uh, in this part, we, uh, we have uh, shown that the self-regulating fibers are prepared via a sequential tempo paridate oxidation. And uh, we've seen that the macroscopic morphology of these fibers are uh, mostly maintained. And then uh, we've also seen that uh, we have strong indications that the modifications are mostly limited to, to fibril surfaces. And then uh, using, this, uh, uh, what, using these fibers, we have demonstrated the controlled swelling of, of these self-fibrillating fibers. And we've seen that the increased osmotic pressure uh, as well as decreased supramolecular order basically leads to uh, swelling of these fibers. And finally, we have applied the controllable swelling of these, uh, of these materials to, uh, to filtering applications. So in part one, we talked about how these materials are prepared uh, and then how they can be, uh, how they swell and why they swell the way they do. In part two, I'm going to talk about their nanofibrillation and how this can be applied to preparing nanopapers fast. So before uh, using these uh, materials to prepare nanopapers, we wanted to uh, correlate their, uh, their nanofibrillation with um, degree of modification as well as pH. And for this, we basically used a simple procedure which relies on the basic assumption that truly liberated charged CNFs do not sediment when, um, when they're centrifuged. So um, what we did was we prepared SFF dispersions at different pH values. And then uh, following this, we have centrifuged them. Then we gravimetrically compared the amount that was um, nanofibrillated to the sedimented amount. And what we have seen was uh, we can obtain about 90% uh, nanofibrillation by uh, increasing the pH to above 10. And uh, the implications of this is, uh, as Professor Saito uh, pointed out earlier, it's big because we can obtain these nanofibrils without requiring high energy intensive nanofibrillation protocols, but that's only one aspect of the problem because we still have the long dewatering times. So we can also follow this pH-induced uh, nanofibrillation by uh, AFM. Uh, going from pH 6 to uh, pH 10, we see a change in structure where uh, around pH 6, everything is you know, together in a fiber, and then as we go to pH 10, uh, things start liberating and uh, we have a different morphology. And uh, we see this gradual loss of fiber structure when we look at the SCM images as well. Uh, at pH 6, we basically see uh, distinct fiber uh, morphology. And when we go to pH 8, the lines start becoming blurry because of swelling. And then uh, when we pass pH 10, things swell and nanofibrillate. And we have uh, uh, a CNF morphology, basically, that's homogeneous and, and uh, different than, uh, than pH 6 when these were fibers. But uh, how can we apply this to prepare uh, nanopapers? So the conventional method of preparing these nanopapers, as I said, is first we take the pulp and then we uh, send these materials through a high energy intensive uh, nanofibrillation process, which we addressed in the first part. And, uh, and then that's not, that's not over. Then we need to uh, dewater these materials, which takes a long time. And then finally we have the nanopaper. So, um, the problem here, or the target, is basically the, the dewatering. Uh, but we need these materials. We need CNFs. They're, they're a must to have. However, they're also the problem. So it's like they're, they're rather the solution and the problem. Maybe we could tweak this process a little bit to, to address this. Uh, essentially, what I mean is if we could uh, perform the dewatering and then perform nanofibrillation using this, uh, these, uh, these fibers, then the question becomes, is it basically, is it possible to delay nanofibrillation of these fibers until after the sheet is formed? So since uh, SFFs basically behave like regular fibers at, at low pH, we can uh, prepare papers at high dewatering speeds uh, using, uh, using these fibers and using ordinary paper making equipment. Uh, these fibers basically look you know, like regular fibers. And how this works is uh, at low pH, at pH 2, 2.53, the, um, the hemiacetals are intact and uh, the carboxyl groups are protonated so the fibers are deswollen and uh, they can be, they can be uh, dewatered quite fast. And then we can perform nanofibrillation on this paper and uh, what happens is uh, these fibers basically go from here to here and how this happens is carboxyl groups deprotonate, 
and hemiacetals break, the fiber swells, as I showed earlier. The only difference is that this happens within a paper. And when the fibers constituting this paper, basically uh, nanofibrillating becomes CNFs, then the paper becomes a nanopaper, uh, essentially. And the important thing here is this is very fast. We can obtain uh, really high dewatering speeds because of the morphology of the material. We can do this uh, whole dewatering and nanofibrillation under three minutes, which is uh, really fast compared to how long it takes to prepare nanopapers, which can go from hours to days, depending on the method you use. Uh, we can also see the, the change in morphology uh, within these, uh, these materials quite fast. And uh, what, when it happens, when we look under, under SCM, we see a distinct fiber morphology when these materials are paper and when, when they're formed. When we perform the in-situ nanofibrillation, because of the swelling and nanofibrillation, we see uh, uh, this uh, complete change in, in the morphology. And we have, uh, basically, the, the fibers are gone, and we have a homogeneous CNF uh, morphology that's, that's different than, than the first one. And what's more important is we see the, these, these changes directly reflect on the, on the material properties. So starting with the mechanical properties, we can, going from papers to nanopapers, we obtain about 70% increase in both um, uh, tensile strength as well as Young's modulus. And uh, this, we, we can obtain this quite fast, as I said. But that's not all because uh, these changes also reflect on the uh, barrier as well as uh, optical properties. So when we go from paper to nanopaper, uh, we see substantial improvements in both 50% RH and 80% RH, which is relative humidity. Uh, in, in oxygen barrier properties. And this can be attributed to densifying uh, the, the, uh, the increased density of the structure. And same thing uh, goes for uh, optical properties. The transmittance increases and haze, which is basically the trans how translucent the material is, decreases. And uh, this can be explained by, uh, again, the densified structure and the uh, uh, lowering of the size of the constituents, all of which uh, contributes to the decreasing in the amount of scattering centers, uh, which in improves the, the optical properties. So to summarize this part, uh, we essentially shown that we can quickly uh, and easily nanofibrillate as well as uh, dewater these materials. So we address the two important problems that, uh, that are about the nanopaper preparation, preparation process. And we can do this quite fast. And how we do this is uh, in this part, we've shown uh, pH-induced nanofibrillation of SFFs, and we've seen that the, the level of nanofibrillation is pretty much related to the degree of modification as well as pH. And we've also observed this visible change in morphology within the papers going to uh, the, the um, or within the fibers going to uh, CNFs. And then we've used uh, what, we've used this concept to uh, prepare papers fast and then in situ nanofibrillate them. And how this uh, works is that we have we have taken SFFs since they exhibit fiber-like characteristics at low pH. We can perform rapid dewatering using uh, conventional paper making equipment, followed by in situ nanofibrillation of these uh, fibers and uh, the paper to obtain a strong transparent and uh, gas barrier nanopaper uh, in uh, under, under three minutes. So uh, we have talked about how these materials uh, are prepared how they swell and why they swell the way they do, how they nanofibrillate, and how this can be used to prepare nanopapers fast. In this part, I'm going to talk about a new materials processing platform using these uh, SFFs and how this can be used to prepare CNF nanopapers as well as functional uh, CNF nanocomposites. And then I'm going to move on to uh, show you three different applications where these hybrids uh, can be utilized. So aside from uh, being able to be uh, in situ nanofibrillated, these CNFs can also be, uh, uh, they, or these uh, fibers can be nanofibrillated uh, within a dispersion, of course. And uh, the idea here is, uh, as I said, we start with the pulp, and then we can nanofibrillate uh, using increasing the pH. But one difference here, normally, uh, we would just dewater the CNF dispersion. But that takes a long time, so we're back where we started. We can, uh, using the pH responsive features of, of this material, since SFFs, the fibers are pH responsive, the CNFs that make it up are also, they have the same properties because of the carboxyl and aldehyde groups. We can lower the pH and assemble these structures. And uh, 
th this assembly is basically attributed to um, the dynamic nature of of hemiacetals, where they can be turned on and off uh, by by changing the pH. So how we prepare these nanopapers? We have the um, the fibers at low. Uh, we disperse them basically. Then we increase the pH. They swell, and then they eventually nanofibrillate. Then before we dewater, we lower the pH to 2.5 and uh, dewater them quite fast. Then dry and obtain a, a highly transparent nanopaper. Now this assembly of uh, CNFs can also be see, followed uh, via AFM. When we go after nanofibrillation, when we go uh, with, these, with these CNFs from pH 8 down to pH 2.5, we see the, um, that these structures start, uh, these materials start associating and the larger structures start forming. And we can, like these, these structures are actually rather big and we can see them by uh, optical measurements such as turbidity. Uh, when we look at the, um, the turbidity measurements, it's, which is basically we have these fibers uh, as a dispersion and then we increase the pH and then we, uh, using turbidimeter, we see the size of the constituents of this dispersion. So going from, uh, high, going from low pH to increasing the pH, we can see the nanofibrillation where particles become smaller. And then as we lower the pH again, the turbidity increases. Basically, the, the, these larger structures start forming and the uh, turbidimeter picks that up. And then what's even more interesting is this assembly is basically reversible. So when we increase the pH again, these structures that are being held together by uh, these hemiacetals essentially break apart because of the the deprotonation of the carboxyl groups uh, as well as breaking of the hemiacetals. Uh, but I will come back to that later in the applications. So using this, uh, this, this method, we can basically uh, prepare nanopapers quite fast and they, perf they, uh, they exhibit highly nanofibrillar uh, morphology. Uh, so this is interesting because it's a, it's a new method of simultaneously nanofibrillating as well as uh, processing these, nano, uh, these, these materials into nanopapers. But then the question becomes, what if we could actually um, put something in there before we perform this assembly? Could we maybe trap something in there to obtain you know, some kind of a nanocomposite? Uh, to test this, we have decided to use gibbsite, which is a pH-responsive clay. And uh, what's interesting about gibbsite is that it has its isoelectric point at pH 10. And what this means is above pH 10, gibbsite is negatively charged. When we go below pH 10, gibbsite reverts its charge to positive. And on top of all this, this pH also coincides with the nanofibrillation pH of, uh, of SFFs. So then using these, uh, these two materials, we prepare hybrids. And how, how do we do this? Pretty much the same way. We have the SFFs in a dispersion. We increase the pH, we swell and nanofibrillate them. But this time, before we actually lower the pH and assemble these structures, we add the gibbsite uh, particles, which are also negatively charged at this high pH. And this uh, essentially uh, ensures uh, colloidal stability. So the structure is uh, very well distributed, things don't agglomerate. And then after uh, we ensure good mixing, we start lowering the pH. And when the pH is lower, two things happen. At first, the gibbsite changes its charge from negative to positive because we're, we're going to, uh, to uh, below its isoelectric point. And this basically um, leads to their electrostatic association with the negatively charged uh, CNFs. And then after they're associated, the second thing as we go uh, even lower in pH, the structures start assemb uh, assembling. And uh, when this happens, we essentially trap these gibbsite, uh, associated gibbsite particles within the CNF network. When we uh, dewater and essentially dry, we pretty much lock in the structure and we have a hybrid. And uh, another interesting thing about gibbsite is that it can actually act as a dewatering aid uh, because of its charge uh, neutralizing capabilities. Um, so when we have the nanopaper uh, with no gibbsite added, dewatering of these materials take about 12 minutes. When we add 28% gibbsite, the dewatering time can be lowered from 12 to uh, basically five minutes. So as I said, the distribution of these materials are very important because for, for composites to, uh, to perform well, 
the distribution must be uh, must be good. We cannot have these uh, phases that are agglomerated in in their own corners. So SCM images show the the layered structure of of Gibbsite within the CNF network, and uh, further SCM images can also uh, indicate how these Gibbsite particles are essentially uh, enveloped. They're uh, they're covered by the CNF CNF network. The distribution uh, can also be uh, seen by uh, the EVS results, where we follow the, the aluminum uh, element. And this, uh, the EVS essentially indicates the, how well distributed these hybrids are, uh, despite how, how fast uh, they're made. And um, because of these, uh, this well distribution and uh, good coverage, the results uh, reflect on the mechanical properties. We get uh, pretty good uh, mechanical properties, about 150 to 140 megapascal uh, tensile strength. And uh, the, the mechanical properties uh, in, uh, follow a trend uh, depending on the gibbsite addition. We see a decreasing trend with added uh, gibbsite in tensile strength and an increasing trend with added gibbsite uh, in Young's modulus. And the same thing goes for optical properties. Uh, as we add more gibbsite, the transmittance is rather decreased and um, haze or translucence of this material increases, and this can be attributed to the increased scattering surfaces because of added gibbsite. But uh, nonetheless, when we look at the pictures of these materials, we see that uh, they're still quite transparent, uh, despite the amount of, of gibbsite added. So uh, as I said, after showing these, how these materials are prepared, uh, now I'm going to talk about how we can apply uh, these materials in, in certain applications. And when we think of clay, of course, the first thing that comes to mind is oxygen barrier properties. So what we see is that at, at 5 weight percent gibbsite, uh, these materials uh, exhibit really uh, excellent oxygen barrier properties. And uh, on top of that, they're, they're prepared very fast. This is attributed to the tortuous path concept, where the layered gibbsite structure is um, basically embedded within the CNF. And if an oxygen uh, molecule wants to come in and go to the other side, it basically has to go through this labyrinth, which essentially prolongs the time oxygen has to uh, go from one side to the other, thereby increasing or improving its barrier properties. Aside from having really good barrier properties, it's also prepared very fast, these, uh, these hybrids. And uh, when we compare the, the oxygen permeability uh, values of, of comparable biobased materials in the literature, uh, with their dewatering time, what we see is that these hybrids are not only performing very fast, they're very good, they're also very fast. Since they're highly transparent, as seen in the picture, they perform very well and they're prepared really fast, we decided to see how they perform against um, oil-based plastics that are generally used in packaging applications today. And what we see is that uh, from the closest competition, which is uh, polyvinyl alcohol, these hybrids perform at least 10 times better um, even though they're prepared really fast and they're, uh, they're fully bio-based. So uh, the second thing when we think of clay that comes to mind is, of course, uh, fire retardancy. Uh, at 28% gibbsite, these materials exhibit uh, flame retardant and self-extinguishing properties because of their improved thermal stability as well as um, resistance to degradation. So how can we explain this? First of all, the simple explanation is that, of course, clay is not uh, flammable. But that's not all, because we only have 20 weight percent clay. And uh, you know, what about the other 80 percent? And the explanation to this is hidden in the structure of the, of the material. Since we have this layered uh, gibbsite structure that essentially covers, uh, that, that, is, that is within the CNF, when cellulose burns, it releases uh, these volatiles. And volatiles essentially feed into the flame when they, if they can reach it. But what happens with these, uh, with these uh, layered structures that we have is basically the, the volatiles are, are trapped and they cannot reach the flame. And same thing goes for oxygen. They also block the oxygen from reaching the flame and feeding it. So um, when the flame doesn't have the fuel, it, it cannot be sustained. Another uh, supporting explanation of this is uh, basically when, these, uh, when cellulose burns, as I said, it releases these volatiles and gas products, and these have to go somewhere. But since they're trapped, trapped this leads to an expansion within the, the structure because they cannot go anywhere. And it forms these, these voids, as you can see in SCM and uh, EDS images. 
these voids essentially act as thermal insulation, and what they do is they hinder the transfer of heat going uh, into, the, into the flame. So basically, all these features um, mean that the, the, the things that fuel the, the fire cannot go in and sustain the flame, so the, the flame extinguishes. And in the third application, we wanted to extend uh, these materials into, uh, into graphite uh, or, or, or other uh, applications than, than gypsite. And uh, the idea here is to prepare um, these bio-based electrodes that can be used, as, uh, that can be used in lithium-ion batteries. So how we prepare these materials, is, it's pretty much the same. Uh, we have the fibers, we, we swell, we nanofibrillate them, and before we lower the pH, instead of adding gypsite, we just add graphite, and then we lock the structure and dewater very fast. And what we see is, uh, is quite interesting. When we, when, we perf when we form these materials, uh, add these electrodes and uh, prepare batteries, we, and we compare the electrochemical uh, performance of these, of these materials to um, basically blade-coated uh, reference electrodes, which, which represent the uh, commercial formulations, we see that these bio-based electrodes uh, in yellow perform on par, if not better. And this can be attributed to uh, their CNF morphology, uh, the nanofibrillar morphology that keeps the structure together. This is important because during high cycling rates, these electrodes actually undergo uh, high strains because of swelling and deswelling, and this can damage the structure, uh, which basically uh, uh, makes the breaks the graph breaks the structure and uh, means that the electrode doesn't work anymore. In our case, that doesn't really happen, and we attribute this to the strong uh, CNF network. Now, what's even more interesting is these electrodes are fully recyclable. And uh, what I mean by this is we can take these electrodes, um, we can break apart the the battery after it's we're done using it, then um, we put put it in the molecular um, mildly alkali environment, and, uh, and then the structure essentially breaks apart because uh, of the same reversibility that I mentioned uh, earlier, and all the um, reversible nature of hemiacetals as well as uh, deprotonation of the carboxyl groups. And then we can take the same, uh, the, these constituents of the original, um, original electrode, we lower the pH again, and then we prepare a second generation recycled electrode and uh, interestingly, this electrode shown in blue behaves uh, just as good as the original um, first generation electrode. And this essentially indicates that our uh, recycling process does not cause irreversible changes in the morphology. Um, aside from being able to prepare a bio-based electrode for batteries, this is also interesting because it has the potential to answer some hot questions today, uh, which are about how these batteries can be recycled, etc. Okay, so to uh, summarize the uh, last uh, part, we've shown that the simultaneous uh, nanofibrillation and assembly of SFFs can be obtained using uh, pH. And uh, we've, we've used this reversible assembly and this assembly of uh, SFFs to, to demonstrate how this can be uh, performed in a, in a, in a dispersion. And then we prepared nanopapers with this uh, that show apparent CNF morphology. And uh, then we have uh, prepared, we combine these materials with gypsite and, and graphite to prepare functional hybrids uh, quite fast. And uh, what, we, uh, what we've seen was the gypsite can actually act as a dewatering aid during the preparation of these materials. And we've seen that we can obtain homogeneously distributed components within these nanocomposites despite how fast they can be made. And finally, uh, we have uh, demonstrated their applications in, in, uh, in gas barrier, flame retardant, and uh, energy storage uh, functional hybrids. And these materials are not only pre prepared fast and uh, they're, they're uh, bio-based, they also perform uh, quite well. So to conclude the, the, the work that's been done in this thesis, we have uh, shown that cellulose fibers are modified via, uh, via tempo peridate oxidation, and uh, their controllable swelling is demonstrated. Then, uh, using these modified fibers, 
we have uh, prepared nanopapers fast using our in-situ nanofibrillation. And then uh, we have shown their simultaneous nanofibrillation and assembly uh, to prepare nanopapers as well as functional hybrids fast. So before I finish, I would like to uh, thank my supervisors, Professor Lars Wokberry and Dr. Per Larsen, for all their, uh, all their support uh, throughout uh, this, all this time. And I would also like to thank my co-authors and collaborators for, for all their uh, contributions and support. I would like to acknowledge Bilerit Korshnas, especially for their direct financial uh, contribution to my project. And I would also like to thank Venova, TreeSearch, BioInnovation, as well as Wallenberry Wood Science Center for their contributions to the project. And finally, I'd like to uh, thank my uh, friends and colleagues uh, in Fiber Technology Division uh, and uh, FPT and beyond uh, for, for all their support and friendship. And uh, thank you all for coming here and listening to this and everybody online that uh, are, are, uh, gave their time to listen to my presentation. Thanks.